morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, on the Eastern side. Uh, we are the Southeast Organic Partnership at Tuskegee University. Today, we are going to be having a spotlight on Southern Pea, and mostly with regards to uh, pesticide, pest issues or uh, disease issues. Uh, and then over the winter time, you know, we'll take a little bit more time to go through uh, cultivation issues and other areas where we can uh, improve our our general growing. But right now, we really want to we really want to focus on the issues that you're dealing with right now, which a lot of times are pest and disease. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and start out with this question because I see Margaret, you have already kind of given a little answer. So maybe we can uh, just go ahead and right away hit that topic. So this comes from one of our North Carolina growers. He says, my organic farm is set up with four foot beds. So that was what I used in the project. I have not grown Southern peas organically before. The conventional farm has five foot beds and uses a planter that generally has about six inch spacing in the rows. So far, my organic peas have lots of plant, but little peas. The fertility was not excessive, but I'm wondering if I should have spaced the transplants more than six inches apart. It is just now getting time for them to make peas, so they may make a decent crop yet. Hi, Dr. Quarko, we hear you. I'm just in the middle of going over a question real quick, so go ahead and get your bearings, and we'll come back to you in just a minute. As he says, Sam says, I choose southern peas because in the heat of July and August, most vegetable crops can't take the hot, humid conditions, but I have seen peas and butter beans thrive. Insect pressure can be a problem for organic production, but that is why I'm excited about this project. It has given me an opportunity to experiment. So far, weeds are reality, and deer hogs have had to be dealt with. Okay, I love these updates from the field, and I just encourage everyone to, to send us updates like that. We love to hear it. It's really what it's all about. Uh, we know you're taking notes in your grower data logs, but we really do look to get those uh, real-time real time updates. And so Margaret answers, and Margaret Bloom Bloomquist is uh, joining us uh, in the meeting, and she's waving here, um, from North Carolina State University. It looks like we have a couple uh, visitors as well, so welcome to, to you as well. Um, and so Margaret says, sounds about right, and row spacing sounds okay too. Thank you for the update. We are also excited at the results from this project in regards to management and organic pesticides for cow peas. Tell us more about your weed strategy. So Margaret, uh, just to start out, do you have anything else to mention on that or any kind of updates from your experience growing peas at, at the research farm? So cow peas are new to us, growing them organically for research here at the Mountain Research Station. Um, and it's been an interesting season all around for most of our region. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much that he's not setting a great crop yet, but hopefully he will. Uh, we're not even flowering yet. Um, but uh, in terms of spacing, we're at four inches. Um, so I think that would work well. And I think even tighter spacing when comparing a conventional and organic system management is appropriate, particularly with those weed issues. So you, you're recommending tighter spacing? I think six inches is fine. It's right on the outside of how close we would probably space them. So just letting you know that that should be fine. I don't think that's an issue of spacing. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? Dr. Chitori is on as well. And Dr. Quark, who just came on. We're just talking about uh, the update from Sam Bellamy over in North Carolina. And if we don't have any other uh, comments on that. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, again, welcome everyone. We have Dr. Franklin Quark who is on the, on the line and he's going to be presenting uh, our spotlight on Southern Pea today. And then after that, after a short presentation, we're going to, uh, we'll take any questions that come up. So please feel free to write those in the chat box or uh, when we signal, uh, just you're welcome to unmute your microphone and go ahead and speak up and we'll kind of facilitate that as we go. So Dr. Kwaku, thank you so much for joining us and for being our expert speaker today. I will turn it over to you. Is it correct that I've got uh, Dr. Tutori's made as the presenter? All right. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, a few solving pea pests. I'll show you a few pictures. Uh, we'll talk about uh, two of the notorious uh, insect pests 
and some of the ways we can manage them. And um, I will not take too long, and then you can ask uh, questions about some of these pests. But before I I start, um, Leslie, was there a question about spacing of the southern trees? Yes, we just kind of covered that with Margaret. Uh, Margaret recommended that uh, the tighter spacing is probably beneficial. She says the six inches uh, in the question is okay, but um, that at the research stations we are doing four inch spacing on southern pea. So yes. if you have anything to add to that, please feel free. Yes, I, I want to add something to that, uh, especially when we are talking about southern peas. Okay. With dead pest management. So, yes, Margaret is right. You do closer spacing, that, that helps. Sometimes it also depends upon what you are dealing with. Okay, there are some insect pests that they don't like that the direct rays of the sun. They don't like direct exposure. They prefer uh, a close canopy. Mm -hmm. If you are having problems with these kinds of insect pests, then you have to weigh carefully. It's a cost-benefit analysis. If you do closer planting, then the tendency of the plants to uh, close the canopy um, increases uh, when they grow. And then if the insect happens to be one of those that like shade from the direct rays of the sun, then it is going to be fatal. On the other hand, that same procedure, if you are you if you are having problems with an insect that prefers the direct rays of the sun, then when you plant closer and the canopy closes, it's one of the IPM methods you use to provide an unfavorable environment for that pest and therefore the pest is not going to do it. But generally, you plant closer and for some disease issues too. It depends upon how the disease spreads from one plant to another. If the disease spreads mainly through contact with uh, infested material, then you want to uh, speak it up a little bit more. Uh, but generally, uh, I just want individual farmers to know that depending upon specific issues you might be facing on your farm, what is typically a good recommendation for your specific situation may not be uh, what you do, depending upon what you have. So sometimes there are differences in uh, what works for different farmers based on what they are having as issues, especially with pests. All right, so I will go ahead and talk about uh, a few uh, pests and when it comes to if it's Do uh, Dr. Quaker, one quick sec. I don't see a screen. Margaret, do you all see his screen? Okay. Oh, okay. No, I'm not sure that screen. We got it now. We see you. We see you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I'll talk about a few uh, pests. Uh, we'll talk about aphids. We'll talk about, uh, we'll mention thrips. Uh, we will talk about the bean leaf beetle, which uh, I must confess is a problem uh, even for conventional growers. And um, it becomes more of a problem for organic growers because of um, the things that need to be done and the kind of insecticides that do a great job against it. Then we have the corn earworm, we have loopers. Uh, we've talked about loopers in a, a previous presentation. We have the European corn borer, uh, cowpea cacilio, sting bugs. We have leaf footed bugs uh, that cause um, all kinds of problems. Now, uh, let me make a, a point real quick. Uh, sometimes we have to be careful the way uh, we look at insect uh, complexes and the way they interact with each other. Uh, it uh, Sometimes they all appear like they are not things we need on our farms, but uh, I know all of us here know that we have beneficial organisms, but I want to stress some of the interactions that occur and, you know, even among insects, they have allies, they have foes, and they have all of that. Let me talk about uh, aphids uh, briefly. I know we've mentioned aphids in previous presentations. 
but I will go ahead and, and, and mention a few other things about API. Typically, when you are monitoring your field or your farm for APIs, we must remember that most of the time, uh, the APIs prefer to be on the underside of the leaf. So if you are monitoring your field and you are walking through your field, you can actually be under the impression that you are doing fine and there is no problem until you turn over the leaves and then you will find out for sure uh, whether you are going to have pro problems pretty quickly. I've, I've had one issue where a farmer kept telling me she was doing fine. Uh, I went to a farm just to help her um, just do a pest survey and just scout and monitor and find out what's going on. And when I started turning the leaves over, uh, they were plastered with um, aphids. And the only reason she couldn't tell is that, well, they had not done uh, enough feeding for her to start seeing the symptoms and the um, uh, poor health um, indicators in the plant. So if you see this, you see that the aphids are on the underside of the leaves. And let me stress again, when they are on the underside of the leaves, you might be, you might have a lot of problems coming up, but you might be under the impression that you are fine. So the best way to monitor for aphids, you turn over the leaves uh, just to be sure. Not every single leaf, um, but I mean, just a survey. And there are different methods that we use uh, to monitor um, crops for uh, aphids. Well, this is, what they look like I, I i should really they, this picture doesn't do it justice you don't see what's going on but i put that picture in there to show you what kind of interactions we have what we call ladybugs or lady beetles well they feed on aphids so they are beneficial this ladybug is beneficial but i don't know whether we are all aware folks feel it's usually uh it's only honeybees that produce honey a number of insects produce honey uh, different, uh, in different quantities. Uh, these aphids that we are talking about, we may not like them, but they produce what we call honeydew. Um, and that honeydew is sweet, and so ants love that honeydew. So because of that, these ants protect the aphids against the lady uh, beetles. So it's um, this is a, my ally, this is a foe, you produce honey that I like, he wants to feed on you, so I'm going to uh, kick him out. So that kind of uh, interaction exists. Problem with aphids, uh, thrips, and a few other insects, they also help to transmit viruses, virus diseases. And if you look at this plant right here, uh, you, you, you generally see those symptoms or the curling of leaves and all kinds of symptoms for virus diseases. The problem with that is that there is no pesticide that can be applied on this plant uh, to, to solve a, 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 an issue of a, a virus disease. All you have to do, uh, if the plant is still healthy, uh, the required amount of nutrients, water and Stuff, hopefully the plant will recover and, and will still be able to produce uh, an appreciable amount of yield. But um, there is nothing you can spray. So the best uh, way to handle it is to catch the problem before and then treat it with the, the, the required pesticide before they get to uh, the stage where they've already infected the plant with the virus. Like I said, at which stage there is uh, not much that you can do. I don't know how many people have had problems with cowpea kekilo, but it is a, a serious problem. Uh, there are farms that have recorded all the way from 20 to 80, 85% damage. They can wipe you out. And um, most of the things, especially for organic farming, and here again, I must say that conventional growers have serious problems managing this insect. And we all have to, and that's when they have access to conventional pesticides, which we all know generally are faster acting. They have a longer residual activity, which means basically they are going to stay active on the treated surface for a longer time. 
uh, relative to uh, organic pesticide. So if conventional growers are having problems with cowpea kikirio, if you are an organic grower and you fail to either prevent this problem or detect it early, or if you need to spray, spray early, any, any way you look at it, you don't have that luxury of time that uh, conventional growers of southern pea have. Uh, you will see something like a scarf, you see a raised spot, uh, dark spot, scarf. Uh, those are some of the things you see on the pore. Now, when you open the pore, then you find things like this, and you see the larvae uh, on the uh, leaves here. Well, if you have that kind of major damage where all the pores have the seeds destroyed in them, uh, that's not in anybody's interest. So they cause major problems. Uh, one of the things about this insect is that they play possum. Where when they see movement uh, or any disturbance, they act like they are dead. You find them, some of the adults are found around the base of the plant. They will be under plant debris and other things. Uh, the major recommendation for this uh, major insect pest is if you find cowpea kekilio at a location, you are supposed to rotate away from that field. Do not plant southern peas. Uh, you may plant other uh, uh, crops that are not within its host range. Uh, you have to leave that field. Sometimes you are told to leave for three years, four years, sometimes two years. But uh, the worst thing you can do is to plant uh, right the next year after you have had this issue because you are only helping the problem to fester, multiply. It's like providing with, with, with constant food. So you have to look at it. There are different species of this that we have, uh, but generally you are asked to look, uh, rotate away from uh, that field for maybe three years. And um, I've seen people say leave for four years and stuff. Uh, it's not, it doesn't mean you are not going to use that field. You can grow other things there that are not susceptible to the problem. We have thrips, uh, which also feed, and they cause discoloration and other problems to the, uh, the, the plant. Uh, they will cause, uh, um, and they uh, importantly transmit um, virus diseases, which is what we have talked about earlier. Uh, so apart from the damage that uh, uh, thrips themselves are doing to the plant directly, uh, then they are also uh, transmitted um, um, uh, viruses. Now, uh, let me quickly, sorry about this, let me quickly go back to aphids and make mention of the fact that apart from the fact that these aphids uh, suck the juice out of the plant because they are piercing, sucking mouth parts, that's not the only problem that is created. You see the sticky material that, uh, like the, the, the honeydew that I talked about, well, it's sticky. And so it traps fungal spores onto the sticky surface, uh, which results in some black sooty mold. So that's a disease situation. Uh, if you bring fungal spores in contact with the leaf surface, then that's a problem, uh, a disease situation. Apart from that, those black sooty molds that result on, on the leaf are basically reduce the surface area available for photosynthesis. So they are sucking the juice out of the plant, that is not healthy for the plant. They are transmitting diseases that is not healthy for the plant. The fungal spores that are trapped onto the leaf surface uh, could cause a result in disease situation, not good. Then the reduction in photosynthesis would directly affect uh, your yield of whatever you are, you are, you are growing. Dr. Corker, will, will you please yes. click hide on that? Uh, strip at the bottom of your video. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Are we okay now? Perfect, carry on. Okay, then we have the Mexican uh, bean leaf beetle. Uh, uh, I don't know how many people have had issues with it. Uh, this is what the adult looks like. The eggs look like that. 
the the larvae have those uh, um, uh, structures like cis uh, rows of those uh, structures that are branched. There are branches of it. Uh, that's what it looks like. They do um, major damage to the leaves. I'll show you a picture. I mean, uh, maybe I should have blown this up, but if you look at the amount of <laughs> the number of holes you have in those leaves, there's going to be very little photosynthesis that occurs um, uh, in that location, uh, uh, in that plant. And when photosynthesis is affected, uh, then that, that directly affects uh, your, your yield, okay? Uh, pesticides are used but uh, there are uh, biological control methods that we rely on there are some parasitoids there are some all kinds of organisms that are released uh to to to, to solve the problem but when it comes to mexican leaf beetle here also we want early detection um like i said um most of the problems that organic growers have uh are worsen i mean if you are detecting this same problem at the same time as a conventional grower because they have access to uh, conventional pesticides which are more which have which are faster in their action uh they stay active for a longer period of time then that becomes a major uh problem so uh first of all you must be able to detect uh the mexican leaf beetle and and another important thing is that you don't rely only on the adult stage to detect them and that's one of the problems we know an insect but it is only when it is in the adult stage that we can tell what it is it's very useful to tell what the eggs look like what the larvae look like so you can always make a connection uh sometimes you have a couple of bees the adults in the field and uh, they are ask somebody's asking what's the have you approached the threshold where you need to spray something and you are thinking well in the entire field i've already seen a couple of them that's not a major problem if you had only know, known that there was a connection between this adult and a lot of these things that you are seeing you make the connection and say oh i, I have a problem so it's important when you know of a major insect pest to know what the various life stages look like. So you can uh, um, uh, know what problem you have and have an accurate assessment where you do your scouting and monitoring to see where the pest populations are. Um, you have to know what is host ranges if you have to rotate away from that field. Uh, uh, and you replace it with another crop that is within its host range i call that just changing what's on the menu that's not that's that rotation schedule may fit other agronomic uh, uh requirements like you are replacing a shallow rooted crop with a, a deep rooted crop so that the crops take nutrients from different root zones yeah that's rotation but if the shallow rooted crop and the deep rooted crop are both within the host range of the pest you are trying to deal with. It satisfies the nutrient uh, utilization and nutrient management of the soil. It doesn't satisfy the pest management aspects of what you are doing. Basically, like I said, it's just changing what's on the menu and, uh, and the insect is still happy. Uh, you may actually be changing over to uh, a crop that it actually prefers uh believe it or not these insects also have their choices if number one is available i'll go for it uh, that's great if that's not available i'll do with number two if i have to i'll go down to number three and if i absolutely have to survive i will just do with four and five so they go they also have that scale of preference and number of insects do so you have to be very careful. Sometimes you are doing this rotation program and you are actually rotating to another crop that is actually preferred by the insect. And uh, another thing, you have to be able to tell the Mexican uh, bean leaf beetle apart from other be beneficial organisms. So uh, identifying um, uh, the pest and being sure it is a pest is a, a major um uh, issue. 
when do you act on this issue in terms of pesticides if you have problems with uh, uh, the medical libido? Well, if the defoliation or the amount of uh, uh, leaf damage is greater than 40% before they start flowering, you have to do something. If uh, the defoliation is greater than 15% after it has between the time it started flowering to pot field, then you have to do something. If it is greater than 25% from the full pot stage to harvest, you have to do something. Uh, typically, organic pesticides, most of the ones available for us to use, they don't have a long pre-harvest interval. What I mean by that is the, the minimum amount of time that has to uh, that you have to let elapse between the last time you sprayed and when you harvest. With a number of the conventional products, you can have somewhere between the time you spray and when you harvest, you have to ha let 21 days go by, 14 days, 10 days. Most of the products that we use, some of them actually have a pre-harvest interval of zero, one, two, and three days. So when you are using pesticides, you also have to bear in mind when you plan on harvesting your produce because you may have pesticides where they tell you, well, pesticide A is the best. Uh, it will result in less take care. I'm just going to use percentages to illustrate what I want to, uh, the point I want to make. Let's assume that you are told that pesticide A is going to result in 90% mortality of the pest and it's so great it does um, a good job and you have pesticide b that does maybe 88 uh, percent uh, mortality and then you are looking at it and somebody tells you pesticide a has a pre-harvest interval of um, one day and pesticide b has a pre-harvest interval of four days and you know you are supplying um, um, a retail chain that wants your produce in the next two days. You do the cost benefit analysis. In fact, if this one is even not cost benefit analysis. You won't be able to harvest that legally um, and, and, and be outside of jail <laughs> if you go ahead and, uh, and harvest within the pre harvest uh, interval period. So these are some of the things. And then we also have, uh, I have a few pictures of the. Uh, um, Salvin uh, P. Kekilio, uh, and one Dr. David G. Riley has uh, done considerable work. It is such a problem that a lot of entomologists leave it alone. People have tried it and they just decided they didn't want to have anything to do with this pest. So there's very little uh, research, but that has changed. Um, people are still coming up with stuff. I hear there are uh, issues um, where they are using some gene editing uh, techniques and um, um, to solve some of these problems. There was one study that he did where a pesticide was applied to the soil and resulted in some very good control, but that pesticide anyway will not be relevant to our organic growers because it's a conventional pro uh, product. And so uh, just to let you know, conventional growers are having issues with that. We also have sting bags that cause problems in southern peas. Uh, uh, they, they, they feed on the pod and cause all kinds of problems. Anything that is feeding on the pod is going to cause uh, uh, major problems. But the reason I put this slide out there, and I'll be sharing this with everybody, is that not all sting bugs are pests. There are actually some sting bugs that are beneficial because they feed on other insects that destroy our crops. And one of the ways you tell them, about, the ones that are beneficial, they have a, a, a thick uh, proboscis. They have a thick mouth part, you know, this uh, piercing uh, uh, mouth part. They have, it's normally more robust and thicker than the pest uh, species. And so I just wanted to, to be careful that in this uh, battle, we don't mistake our allies for our foes uh, and, and start sort of shooting those helping us. So, so we have to uh, bear some of this in mind. And some of these storage pests, uh, and not only that, uh, th th this is what we call the uh, cowpea weevil, 
which is um, uh, um, it's a major pest. Uh, I don't know how many of you have, do um, dry beans or peas. Uh, you see uh, when you have the eggs on the peas, you see specks, ray spots, uh, oval shaped uh, um, eggs all over the place. And this is what the adult looks like. The problem with this is infestation starts in the field and then goes follows the crop into storage, resulting in major losses and a few other problems. Uh, all the topics we've been discussing so far, we are going to send out or, or share with you fact sheets that talk about identification, uh, the um, uh, tre treatment threshold, all the cultural practices, uh, that you have to use where for some of them, like the Mexican leaf beetle and some of them, you don't, you don't want uh, plant debris on their uh, line around, giving the adults places where they could hide, all kinds of cultural practices and then recommended pesticides uh, that work against them. When you find yourself in situations where you have to use pesticides and, and stuff like that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll I'll stop here and ask if there are any questions on what we have discussed so far. Dr. Corbin, Hello? thank you so much. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Is there, are there any questions? And for the callers, I have unmuted your phones as well. So please feel free to ask away. You can also write it in the chat box. <laughs> or are there any other comments from our other uh, experts on the line? This is Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Hi, I'm certainly no expert, but I have had good success with ordering extra ladybugs during the pea season, <laughs> and it, they pretty well take care of the aphids and some other insects. Yes. And we don't have enough ladybugs to do that, so every season I order some extras from California. Okay, okay. Good, good, good. Thank you for chiming in. And as Dr. Corku mentioned that uh, we will share all of this information uh, in the chat box. I have put an address. It's southeastorganics.helpdocs.com and that's southeastorganics.helpdocs.com. Uh, that's where we're putting this information as we as we develop it. So it is not a full, complete uh, knowledge base yet, but we're hoping by the end of this project that it will be full and, and complete with information. Uh, but all of the lunchbox meetings are going to be recorded uh, and and then hosted there, uh, along with the slides and other information uh, from these meetings. So please be sure to check out southeastorganics.helpdocs.com for that information. And Dr. Corka, do you have anything to finish up? We're coming up on time, so we will. If there are any questions, yeah. I'll take them. Uh, if not, then I, I, I will just uh, um, make sure all the, the information that I need yeah, I put together and uh, we will then go ahead and share. It. Great. And as Question. oh yeah, go ahead. Uh Franco, can you comment on thrips uh, and leaf hoppers briefly for cow peas in particular? Say that again. Thrips and leaf hoppers. Yes. Do you have any comments on them for cow peas in particular? Okay, uh, in in terms of their management, with we, 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 uh, leaf hoppers, uh, we have different types of leaf hoppers. They, they, uh, normally, you would want to monitor uh, what uh, the population, we have to still go by the IPM method where you have to check their thresholds. 
one of the ways, uh, important ways that you check for their thresholds is to use uh, yellow sticky cards. How, how many of us, are we all familiar with yellow sticky cards? You can give a quick no. explanation. Yeah, uh, it's just a yellow card that has, uh, a, it has covers on both ends. Uh, when you peel it off, it's sticky, and then you put it on a wire, a, a special wire holder, but it doesn't have to be that uh, special wire holder. And then basically you put, you, you stick it in the ground in, on your farm uh, within the plant row, but you have to keep the sticky surface just above the plant canopy. And when we trap the, uh, the, the um, leaf hoppers on that, we will be able to assess uh, by looking at them counting and be able to tell whether we have approached the threshold. Issue with the leaf hoppers is that they have piercing sucking mouth parts. And so they are going to be uh, uh, sucking things out of the plant. They also transmit diseases. Uh, they are mouth but yes they transmit diseases and cause all kinds of problems so you monitor um sometimes weed control is important sometimes there are some plants that are around uh, your field that are going to serve as uh, hiding places for some of these leaf uh, hoppers and if you find out that you have populations that have attained a certain threshold then you use uh, recommended pesticides, you spray, and then uh, try to deal with them. But um, for most places, leaf hoppers just come in uh, and um, they cause major problems. With thrips, um, I don't know whether Dr. Chituri uh, would like to uh, make some statements about that. She's done quite a bit of work with thrips. But with them, apart from the discoloration and uh, a deformation of uh, uh, the, the plant leaves and all the kind of diseases that they transmit. Uh, if you miss out on early detection of thrips, uh, you can very quickly get to the point where it no longer makes sense for you to spray pesticides because uh, the damage they may have done by that point uh, spraying uh, pesticides at that point will not be cost effective you may actually be digging yourself further into debt because uh, at that point, uh, they may have done so much damage that um, uh, it's it, it just costing you more to, to spray. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me find out whether uh, Dr. Chituri has some additional comments that she wants to make on thrips. Hello? Dr. Jatori, we see that your, your uh, mic is unmuted now, so give us a give us a test and see if we can hear you. Okay, we cannot hear Dr. Jatori. And, and 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 when? Oh, are you can there? You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. So getting to the, the trips and the leaf hoppers aspect, I think uh, it's technically the yellow sticky cards is the very best method to monitor at least the trips. Um, like uh, Dr. Korku mentioned, uh, that would be the, the best way to monitor trips. But the critical thing is here, um, when you see trips on the sticky cards, uh, that's like when you are looking into the trips, like they are very tiny, so one visual aspect would be when you take off your traps back and when you see thrips, that's when we have to pay attention. Like how many thrips are we seeing per trap? Like if you are seeing, for example, you have set up the traps in a, in a average, the plant number is about 10 plants and you're setting up three traps at a distance of 2.5 feet difference. And if you are seeing on an average three traps, if you are seeing about like 10 to 20 thrips, or like you are seeing one to two trips, or you are seeing five trips. So that depends on the number. The threshold is again, like if your trips numbers per trap is exceeding more than five per trap, I'm talking about per trap. 
if the number of adult trips you are seeing on per trap is exceeding more than five, then it's, it's an alarming thing to see that there are considerable trips numbers out on the crop because the trips are so tiny. Um, you don't see the, the eggs that are laid on the crop canopy because they are like 0.5 to 1 mm in length, the active adults. So imagine how tiny the eggs are going to be. So they're going to be like the eggs that are already laid on the canopy and we won't be able to see. So, so if you are seeing trips on the sticky traps, you just have to ensure, uh, uh, have a visual sampling of the traps for the entire field. And then we just go ahead and do the, 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 the spraying. I'm not saying right away, it depends like again, like you know, in some of the plots or in some of the plants, you might see trips. And in some plots, like if you are doing different treatments, you might not see the trips. So it's always best to target a spot treatment, especially with the case of trips. But whereas if you are seeing hoppers, leaf hoppers, it again depends on the threshold. So if we have, if we have uh, like on an average, if you are seeing, um, let me make sure I'm giving you the, the correct number for um, the leaf hoppers. Um, yeah, I would say probably about like, you know, um, three to three to four leaf hoppers. Uh, on an average, we would say like 10. Uh, 10 would be a good number, but it's kind of it's kind of hard to see when you're visually seeing. But definitely trips would be alarming and leaf hoppers because of the piercing and sucking mouth parts. So it's always better. Your yellow sticky cards is one way of monitoring. It is just a monitoring mechanism to see the threshold of the pest in the crop. So if you see the numbers, I think we just have to go ahead and look into the spraying part because by the time you realize the damage caused by thrips, the, the plant is already sick. Because like Dr. Kirkwood mentioned, you see the symptoms of curling, withering, because the photosynthesis, the green tissue is trapped out of the leaf. So this would be one, one critical way. And again, it depends on being organic growers, how practically we can set up the traps and how practically we can pick the traps and monitor for the pest. So um, if you are seeing initially these with the traps, I think that would be one good mechanism. You could go ahead and do the spraying and follow the rules that, you know, we are spraying on the top of the canopy and then the underside of the canopy because the trips are going to be, the nymphs are going to be on the underside of the leaf. The actuators are flying in the air, but the natural damage that is caused by the anguans is on the underside of the leaf or inside. So the, we need to make sure that when we are spraying, we are covering the plant completely. So I think um, this, this, should, uh, this should help for what the question was raised. Uh, and thanks so much. And another thing that I'll quickly like to add is that most of the time, uh, when you get to the point with thrips where you have to spray, uh, we have to be careful. Uh, sometimes we assume that organic pesticides uh, do not have any effect on beneficial organisms. That is not <laughs> completely correct. They, they generally, uh, and depending upon which specific organic pesticide you are talking about, they generally uh, are more friendly, uh, more, uh, they cause less harm generally, but there are a few that you still have to watch out. So if the plant is in its flowering stage and you are having to spray for some of these thrips, remember, that you have to follow recommendations on the pesticide label because they might tell you to spray late in the afternoon or evening. Uh, they are trying to make sure that your the time you spray does not coincide with the time that the um, uh, beneficial organisms um, are most active, like plant pollinators, um, and, and other things, so uh, generally a number of beneficial organisms that may be active during uh, mid-afternoon or morning, uh, that's precisely why you may be told 
to 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 pick a late afternoon spray instead of uh, midday spray and it's also because some of these products when you expose them to high temperatures and um, um, uh, light intensity they may break down into less harmful products or at least may not be as effective as you would have them be if you are spraying them during, uh, at midday so you have to we have to be very careful about this perspective um that is very common about organic pesticides so you are going after the trips but if you don't do it right then you hit the trips but then you find out that you are killing some beneficial organisms that were not your target to start with yeah i just want to add one more thing um coming to the trips aspect uh, there are economically damaging trips and uneconomically damaging. So we just have to ensure again. So that is what I say, like monitoring through sticky traps would be the best mechanism. But again, we have to decide on whether they are economically damaging or they are not damaging. It again depends on the crop canopy or weed management, because if you are having a lot of weeds, you are ending up seeing a lot of non-economic trips. So leaf hoppers is always, is it again depends on the weed management. So you just have to ensure like, are we targeting the economically damaging trips or we are damaged, we are targeting the non-economic trips. So um, like, I think that would be one key thing because like if you are going for crops like tomatoes and uh, other solanaceous crops, definitely you have the trips that can transmit viruses. So there is nothing you could do with the spraying part once the plant is already infested the virus is already transmitted. But I think technically in terms of Southern P, the pressure of thrips would be uh, nominal. That is what I'm assuming uh, because we didn't see much thrips pressure down here in our plots um, because we had the problem of weeds. So that's why our, our other problems like the hoppers were very, very high um, and they, were, they started damaging the, the, the plants. So you just have to keep these things in mind uh all trips are not economically damaging so at any point if you guys have any any doubt about um you are always welcome to uh, send us a, a specimen or like a trap that has trips we can definitely look into that but uh, yeah that would be one way of uh, monitoring yeah Thank you so much, Dr. Chatori and Dr. Korku. We are running up against our time, so we're going to go ahead and close it out today. We do encourage you, if you have any questions, please be sure to contact your main project uh, person. And as always, copy organic at tuskegee.edu. Email is actually the best way uh, and the quickest way usually to get a hold of uh, our experts. So please uh, do that if you can. And if not, you can definitely always give us a call. Thank you so much, everyone. And once again, we are the Southeast Organic Partnership at Tuskegee University. And we look forward to seeing you next week uh, where we will review uh, harvesting tips. So thank you so much and everyone have a great day. Thank you.